Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for uh, coming to, uh, to hear this lecture I'm going to tell you. It's about something that a lot of people don't think too much about. And it'll, it's uh, something that will definitely get you thinking about uh, eye care and eye pressure in a, in a different sort of way. But as I did yesterday, I'm going to uh, sort of set the mood by playing guitar just for a little while. Here we go. So today we're gonna to talk about what happens to your eye pressure when the eye itself is compressed. When we think about uh, the pressure of the eye, the, uh, the, the measurements that we think about are normally with devices that are available in the clinic or the operating room. But the truth of the matter is, as my mentors for glaucoma uh, reinforced for me, is that the uh, only true eye pressure is the pressure that you can measure directly. And what that means is you have to put a cannula into the eye uh, in a calibrated system and measure the uh, hydrostatic pressure of the eye directly. We say we measure the eye pressure with the Goldman tonometer or the Perkins tonometer or any of these other things that are on your screen. But the truth of the matter is that doesn't measure the intraocular pressure. What that does is it estimates the intraocular pressure, which is pretty good because it's better than poking a hole in the eye most people would not tolerate that. So you have to have an alternative. Um, the term tonometer uh, is something that uh, is, is debated amongst uh, clinicians and scientists. Uh, and if you were to try and measure, or I will say estimate the intraocular pressure during sleep, if a person was laying down in a position where you could not use a slit lamp, there are a number of things that you could use to check the eye pressure, uh, like a Perkins tonometer or a Numa tonometer, which is on a little cable. Uh, and that's even true if you were laying on your side and you had your eye exposed to the air where you had access for the device. But what do you do if you wanna ask the question, what's the intraocular pressure for an eye that is closed and against something where you have no more uh, access to the eye. So since there was no uh, device available that is uh, capable of doing this, I had to invent something that, that did so. So I thought about the physics of, of how this would be and uh, there is a device, which I will show you in a moment. But as I contemplated this, I wondered what are the times when the eye is actually compressed externally when the intraocular pressure might be clinically important? So the longest period of time that happens throughout a person's life is during sleep. 
And sleep postures uh, vary amongst people. Some people prefer uh, one posture over another. Most people who sleep change their sleeping position during the night, but not everybody. Some people have like an orthopedic problem where they, they have to sleep on one side or some other medical condition, but most people uh, will change positions. And, and it's been studied that the average length of time for a given position in the average person is about 15 minutes. So if you sleep uh, in a position where one of your eyes is dependent and against the pillow or the mattress or your arm, on average, that position will be held for about 15 minutes. But there are other times when the eye is compressed. Uh, there have been many cases uh, in the literature presented for people who had general anesthesia where the patient was placed in the prone position and they had some procedure and they woke up without vision because the compressive effect of, of the weight of their head in a passive uh, setting was enough to impair the inflow of blood and create uh, enough ischemia so that, that the optic nerve and or retina died. People that uh, get massages are often placed in these prone positions. And uh, recently with the COVID pandemic, uh, people that uh, are on respirators have, have been uh, placed into the prone position because it has been shown that the oxygenation uh, of a patient who's intubated in this position is, is more effective. And that's a position of risk for this particular kind of thing. Another thing that happens uh, commonly is people who are swimmers who swim laps for exercise, the tiny little swim goggles that fit within the, uh, the eye sockets that are also ironically compressed against the eye with elastic straps, those apply uh, an external force to the eye. And so we were trying to figure out what happens under such circumstances with the intraocular pressure. So the physics behind this is going to be described by this diagram. So the top of the diagram right here, imagine you had a, a, a can of tennis balls and there were two tennis balls in the can and you were to apply a force to this tennis ball uh, in short order because of the contact, the force that you apply to this tennis ball, whatever pressure, is inside this ball becomes the same pressure inside this ball, assuming that the, the wall thickness of these two vessels is the same or similar, that they don't have uh, different compliance or different elasticities. Then the next example is, if you were to put a non-compressible septum, uh, like a piece of wood or something like that between these two balls, you apply an external pressure, that would also lead to these two becoming pretty quickly having the same pressure inside of them. If instead of a rigid uh, non-compressible septum, you put a compressible septum, but one that would not compress all the way, as you apply pressure to this ball, the pressure in this builds up until it has uh, reached the ability of that vessel to expand, and then the pressures of all of these become the same. So in, in a human, uh, if we presume that I have a structure that I build that is this uh, device right here, if the eyelid is the compressible septum and this is the eyeball, if the performance of the physics of the wall of this vessel is comparable to this one in the sense that it's flexible, like the eye is flexible, but it's not elastic. You can't put pressure in it. It doesn't get bigger. After a very short order, the pressure you add just raises the pressure of the fluids in the system. So it's, this is the physics by which the device I invented is based upon. So to get a material like that, we had the uh, little blister packs that you open up like sterile tetracaine in and the plastic wall of those uh, was very convenient in the sense that it was flexible, but if you, if you sealed it off, you couldn't make it expand uh, with the pressures that we're looking at. And uh, thankfully, the material is uh, heat sealable. So I was able to seal the two sides of this together, and then there is a 
high pressure hosing, polyethylene hosing, that you could put into this system so that when you heat seal it, you could fill this bladder, I call it a bladder, with uh, saline or water, it would expand to be the one of those vessels that's applied to the eye. And then there'd be a continuity of the fluid column from what was inside of the little bladder through this line to the pressure transducer. And the pressure transducer was a very uh, fancy device that you could calibrate with a stopcock with a fluid column that you would raise. And so you could put that on the, uh, the strip chart recorder, the calibration of this, and then you would connect the fluid line coming from the bladder to the pressure transducer after it was calibrated. So when that was to occur, if I was to take that little bladder and lift it up in the air, you would see that the strip chart recorder would show you the number of millimeters uh, of mercury or centimeters of water that the thing was above the plane of the pressure transducer so that all of the measurements we made uh, started with the patient being where their cornea was at the level of the pressure transducer so that there'd be uh, no hydrostatic pressure from the bladder being elevated above the patient's eye. And of course, to make this sensible, uh, you have to have a, uh, a thing to measure. So we took initially uh, human, fresh human cadaver eyes, uh, which we uh, brought up to um, normal eye pressure with between about 15 millimeters of mercury with fluid that was injected through the optic nerve. And we measured that with a Perkins tonometer. And then we put that into a moistened box where a sponge was hydrated to mimic the, uh, the orbit. And then we took a glove and put some water in that, which would mimic the uh, eyelid as a compressible uh, septum. And here you see the bladder that's applied through the eyelid to the central cornea. And that was the model that we used for the human eye. But we have not yet cannulated the eye. So I had to create a needle that had a slot cut in the side of it with a Dremel that didn't cut the needle in half. And we super glued the sharp end. And then we were able to fill this entire system with water. And then I could place this needle across the anterior chamber in two locations, temporal and nasal. So this would puncture the nasal uh, limbus. And then this slot would end up in the uh, anterior chamber and you would run fluid through this as you uh, placed it across the anterior chamber. So then this needle was secured both here and here, and the slot was in the middle of the anterior chamber. And then there'd be a fluid continuum from within this slotted needle through a high pressure hose all the way back to the transducer. So now you have a system where you have two uh, channels. One of them is the pressure pillow, the bladder, and one of them is the cannulated uh, eye. And then once you have them zeroed out, you could compare one to the other. And so this is a tracing, a simultaneous tracing of this is the cannulated eye tracing, and this is the, uh, the little bladder filled with fluid. And uh, although the scale on these two things is different, the uh, simultaneity of the tracings is pretty obvious that the changes in pressure applied externally to the globe were immediately sensed by the cannulated eye through a range of pressures from nominal zero up to about 150 uh, millimeters of mercury, which is a very large range of pressure. But as you will soon see, it's not incompatible with what actually happens to people uh, when they are um, intact. So that was a human cadaver eye. The question became, what if we had a live animal that we could do this with? And so uh, as opposed to a human cadaver, we, we got access to a, uh, a pig that was undergoing some kind of uh, orthopedic surgery for research. And they gave us access to the eye. And I set up the, uh, the system that I showed you. And here is external application of the fluid-filled bladder 
with the uh, the intracameral direct measurement of the intraocular pressure for the pig. And again, you, you can see that there is a very close tracing of the two. There is a little delay that isn't purposeful. So you could see one versus the other. That's just because the channel was that way. But if this is phase shifted slightly, you would see that these are basically overlapping one another. So that seemed to be a pretty good validation that the estimate, not the measurement, but the estimate of the interocular pressure during compression could be approximated using this technique. Then we took uh, actual people uh, in the clinic and we positioned them on their side. And while they were on their side, the eye that was dependent was placed upon a pillow and we interplaced this a uh, fluid filled bladder across their closed eye before they put their eye upon the pillow. And then for a simulated five minute period of time, like they might be during sleep, remembering that 15 minutes of, uh, of a sleep posture is, is common. So for five minutes, we had them assume that position. And here, here's the results for this. During that uh, period of time, and I'm gonna show you a couple tracings, the mean uh, estimated eye pressure for people uh, in a time-weighted average was, uh, was pretty high in, in several of the people. Here's a 57, that was the average pressure. Here's a 27, a 21, and a 21. Their intraocular pressure before they assume this position is over here. So you can see that in all uh, conditions except for one, where the coupling of the little fluid filled bladder with the eye was probably not uh, good. Uh, generally, the pressure that was experienced during the compressive act is higher than the gold bond measurement before or after the simulated sleep. And you will also see that the eye that was the dependent eye has a lower intraocular pressure after the compression which is what you would expect for somebody who has a, a normal outflow facility who had external compression because we know that that lowers the eye pressure. So that, that's kind of a positive control that the dependent eye experienced a decrease in pressure. During the sleep uh, session, this first subject had an eye pressure that ranged during the actual five minutes between 100 millimeters of mercury and 19. Here's one between 30 and 13. Here's one between 95 and 14. And if you think about the magnitude of those measurements, if somebody had that kind of problem uh, in the daytime, we would be very, very concerned because we would think of it as a long-term, uh, maybe not chronic, but for you know hours of time. This problem is not probably hours long. This is more intermittent that depends on the person's uh, sleeping posture and sleeping behavior. Uh, here is a tracing of uh, subject A that had the range of pressure between 19 and 100. Uh, and you can see that they, as they moved with their eye upon the pillow, there were just different ramps of pressure. Here's a pressure of 21, here's a pressure of 32. Uh, and so it depends, as you might expect, uh, about the degree of coupling of the eye with the, uh, the thing that's causing the compression. So if you, if you have full compression, you expect a higher uh, induced uh, intraocular pressure. And if you roll off of it, you have, you have a lower one. Here is uh, subject B. Uh, subject B had uh, a beautiful tonographic in the old days with the uh, Shiat sonometer, uh, people would do tonography where they would look to see uh, if about the outflow facility. And these little, little waves that you see here are uh, respiratory. They are, they, are, they are part of what you normally would expect uh, for little oscillations during an actual measurement where there's a coupling of a device like a Shiat or this little water-filled bladder and the, uh, and the eye. So this, you can see that the pressure 
<coughs> excuse me, uh, changed over time. But during the average time, it was uh, uh, elevated compared to the baseline. So then we, we said, if that's true, then how will we determine in a population of people uh, whether this is clinically important? Not, not just theoretically clinically important, but, but how, how does it manifest? So I decided to take a look at patients that we saw in the clinic who had a cup to disc ratio asymmetry. So one side had a 0.4, one side had a 0.3. That would be a cup to disc ratio that was at least 0 0.10 in size. People that had 0.4 on one side and 0.2 on the other, they would have a, a 0.2 difference. And I did not concern myself with whether 0.2 was different between say a 0.7 and a 0.5 versus a 0.4 and a 0.2. Although uh, geometrically to go from a 0.5 to a 0.7, you've lost more nerve fiber because the, the diameter of the cup has a greater number of axons as you go from 0.5 to 0.7. But I didn't quibble with that. We considered all people with a cup to disc ratio of 0.2 to be in this classification. And so I then said, okay, those are the people that have what looked like an asymmetric optic nerve. I had to make sure that they did not have a corresponding amotropia because sometimes a big eye will have a bigger cup than a small eye. So if somebody had an amotropia uh, that would explain it where one side was more myopic and that one had the bigger cup, those people were excluded. So you had to have a, a balanced uh, refraction. And so we asked people with this uh, pre-existing cup to disc ratio asymmetry, tell me when you sleep at night, uh, do you sleep on your back or your tummy or your side? And if they said, I don't know, then they weren't in the study. If they said, I think, uh, I, think I sleep on my side, I would say, do you think you have a preferred side where one side is down more often than the other? And if they made the declaration that they in fact were side sleepers and had a preference for sleeping with one side down more than the other, then they were included in the study. So this data shows me that uh, people who had a 0.1 uh, cup to disc ratio asymmetry, uh, those people had uh, a preferred sleeping on the side with the larger cup uh, with uh, uh, 71 versus 15, the probability of that was very small. As the cup to disc ratio asymmetry got bigger, the same kind of probability held. It isn't like it diminished. Uh, it looked like people who have a cup to disc ratio asymmetry who were aware that they had a side preference had a very strong correlation between the side that was dependent and the side with the larger optic nerve cup. This is another graphic of the same set of data. This is the patient's age. And anything above this horizontal line, this is the cup to disc ratio asymmetry. So the bigger asymmetries go up like this. And the same thing on the bottom, this is a cup to disc ratio asymmetry. Anything above this line that's a solid dot is a person who preferred sleeping on the same side, on the right side, uh, that also had a enlarged optic nerve cup on the same corresponding side. And the same thing is true on the left. Any place you see a little tiny plus is a person who says I preferred sleeping on my left side who had a larger cup to disc ratio on the left side. So, uh, that, that's uh, very suspicious and suggests that if there is no other explanation for uh, a cup to disc ratio, like for example, I did not mention this, but during the uh, evaluation and enrollment, anybody that had an asymmetric intraocular pressure in the daytime, they were also excluded. We're looking for any reason why somebody would have a larger optic nerve cup. So. Uh, people that were uh, reporting like trauma to one side or someone who had pigment dispersion on one side and not on the other. These were people that we excluded. We're looking for people that, that have a cup to disc ratio asymmetry and no other obvious reason for it
who had a reported preference for sleep posture. So assuming that this is a real phenomenon, what could elevated intraocular pressure at nighttime, that's a cult, nobody knows about this, but if it's a cult, what could that do to you? Well, one obvious thing is that people could develop progressive glaucoma uh, when they come into the clinic, their, their visual field is worse, their OCT is worse, but their intraocular pressure is inexplicably nice and low. I don't understand what that is. So I asked all of these people, especially if there's an asymmetry about their sleep posture, and if they are side sleepers, the thing that I have been doing now for 15, 20 years is offering them the uh, rigid shield that we use after cataract surgery that produces a dome over the globe so that if you roll over onto uh, that eye, there cannot be any globe compression because the forces of the weight of your head are uh, distributed to the bone around the eye, which of course won't cause any trouble. Uh, an additional problem uh, that we discussed when we were thinking about this is the concept of nocturnal systemic hypotension. There are people who have uh, a, a reduction in their blood pressure while, while they sleep. That's actually relatively common. But there are people who have an accentuated reduction in their blood pressure uh, at, at nighttime. They're called deep dippers, of course, for whatever that's worth. And there's a, another group of people who uh, take blood pressure medicines for systemic hypertension. They take them at night because in the daytime, the reduction in the blood pressure that is uh, experienced at the onset of the drug effect can, can give them symptoms of dizziness or, or orthostasis or things like that. So they take it at nighttime because they figure, what could happen? I'm not gonna experience any problems. I'm just taking this medicine at nighttime. Well, it turns out that there is a balance between the perfusion of the optic nerve that is related to the blood pressure coming in and the intraocular pressure pushing against the blood vessels. And if the two of them become approximately equal or the perfusion pressure, the effective perfusion pressure drops, then you have relative hypoxia. So if you have a person that's a so-called deep dipper and they're taking blood pressure medicine at nighttime and you lay on your eye for 15 minutes and the eye pressure goes to 80, uh, this can be a real problem for people. Uh, and I believe that this is a aggravating factor, not only for uh, glaucoma patients, but I think there's other things that could be at play. There are people who have uh, ischemic uh, vasculopathies that uh, occur uh, during, during surgery. Uh, so compression of the eye, so they, they now have special uh, kinds of pillows and uh, devices that you put your head in so you can't compress your eye. Uh, I believe one of my hypotheses, and it's a hypothesis, is that there are children who experience uh, what's called a sudden infant death syndrome, where they, 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 uh, they die in their sleep. And uh, the, as you probably are aware, when you compress your eye, especially if you have a very active, uh, young uh, uh, neurologic uh, loop, you can create a uh, oculocardiac reflex where you'd create a bradycardia from ocular compression. So it's at least theoretically possible that some children laid on their side with their eye in a dependent position could experience a oculocardiac reflex that's sufficient to create death, which is a terrible thought. Um, another idea that I believe is related to this is uh, uh, macular degeneration. The macular degeneration, the layers in the back of the eye are uh, structurally not sound. They, are, they crack open so that the vasculature and the chorial capillaris has access to the subretinal space. And if you think that compressing the eye with a pressure of, a, of 100, uh, is sufficient to mechanically cause uh, structural changes in those layers, either acutely or over time. I believe that that's possible. And there's also the belief 
that uh, AMD conversion from the dry to the wet form involves some kind of ischemia. And if your perfusion pressure to these regions of the eye is uh, insulted repeatedly through the night, night after night after night, uh, I believe that this mechanism could be an aggravating factor for the conversion of people from the wet, from the dry form of macular degeneration to the wet form. And there's also people that uh, I've experienced, and I bet you have too, that come to you with a retinal vein occlusion uh, and, and they say, well, I, I went to bed normal and I woke up with this. I don't know what that's all about. Well, I think ocular compression during sleep is plenty sufficient to explain this because so far I've been talking about the, uh, the del deleterious effect of external compression on arterial blood supply. But if you compress a vein, you will create turbulence in, in the vein and turbulence in the venous system is a, uh, a, a common cause for thrombosis. That's, that's, a, that's a problem. So I believe that uh, in the right or wrong group of people, they could have an underlying uh, vasculopathy that sleeping on their eye could trigger a, uh, a venous occlusion. And the last thing is the idea that people that have abnormalities in the blood vessel wall, which includes people that have uh, like hypertensive retinopathy or people that have diabetic retinopathy, those blood vessel walls mechanically are fragile. That means that they're vulnerable to the blood pressure, which is why blood pressure is an aggravating factor for diabetic retinopathy because you're pushing from the inside out and causing structural weakness where fluids can leak out or, or actual rupture of the blood vessel. But I believe that pressing on the blood vessel from the outside is also an aggravating factor and probably leads to increased uh, uh, leakage of, of fluid and is probably an aggravating factor in at least some people who have uh, underlying tendencies towards diabetic retinopathy. And so what is a clinician to do? Well, as I mentioned earlier, uh, using a protective shield over the eye is, is very simple. Uh, it's very inexpensive as long as it doesn't locate, you know, overnight it's on the person's ear when they wake up. As long as it stays over the eye, this is a very effective treatment. And I've been doing this for, uh, like I said, for, for a couple decades. I've even invented a thing that has two of them side by side with a with a strap that sort of looks like a scuba diving mask. Uh, you wind up looking like a superhero or a, a giant bug, but that, that also would be an effective, uh, effective treatment. Most people don't go for that because uh, they'll go for one side, but not for both sides. But it's, it's theoretically something that mechanically should be of benefit. So I realize that that's kind of different from what we normally think of uh, when we take care of people. But in my mind, when I see people, those are the kinds of things I wonder about. What kinds of, what kinds of exposures might you have? Uh, not the ones that people can observe in a normal setting, but when you're by yourself, what kind of things could you be doing that maybe uh, is leading to a worsening or a creation of your disease? And so this is the genesis of this project. And I uh, wanna thank uh, the Congress again for giving me a chance to, to address you and to, to uh, bring you these ideas to, to kind of stimulate your thought process. And I hope, I hope next year that the COVID virus is, uh, is uh, not a problem so I can come and, uh, and be with you in person. But for right now, I would be happy to take any questions that you might have. Thank you very much. So thank you very much, Dr. Kornfeld, for this. Gives an insight to a different perspective of uh, things that we consider trivial, but they might actually have a major role in uh, the progression of certain diseases. And if I may add to another correlation, it has been long uh, suggested by Dr. Gattinell that the, the progression of keratoconus is reduced to eye rubbing and uh, uh, actually trauma on the collagen fibers and actually suggested that uh, he actually verified that through videos from his practice of people rubbing the eyes 
of the particular, mostly one-sided. So we have an asymmetrical progression of the disease. And now you're putting another aspect that it's not only to, to micro trauma to the collagen fibers, but the actual elevation of the intraocular pressure for a longer period of time, because it was very, very difficult only to speculate that eye rubbing for probably a few seconds per day would actually induce that kind of trauma that will change the elastic properties of the cornea and get to the progression of the disease. But a long-standing difference on the eye pressure, on the intraocular pressure, will actually be to susceptible eyes that have more elastic properties to, to a definite uh, and logical progression of the disease. So actually by just doing the shielding at the night, it might actually prove quite beneficial to this kind of patients. And that might be another aspect that we might actually uh, add to what you already very nicely mentioned and brought forward. Well, Are I there any further a, questions? Yeah, please. Hold, hold on, I'd like to respond to that. That's very yeah. smart. I, hadn't, I, I literally hadn't thought of that. And I, if you don't mind, I'm gonna add that to my slides. But yes, that, that makes a lot of sense uh, that, that is definitely something that we were taught that rubbing the eye uh, in a susceptible person is a risk factor for the, for the manifestation and worsening of keratoconus. Uh, but, but at nighttime, I mean, there's, there's much, much longer aggregated durations of exposure to this. Uh, and, and the beauty of it is if you wear a shield at night, especially if you have a, a, either an asymmetric or unilateral keratoconus, uh, people are much more willing to wear a shield on one side than both sides. And, and wouldn't that be a beautiful, inexpensive way of doing it? I mean, there's no cross-linking required and you don't need fancy equipment. You just need a piece of plastic. Well, there, there have been, uh, from, from the early days of refractive surgery, uh, many, many from the old surgeons, uh, when they had to address an ectasia, they were trying to lower the intraocular pressure as much as possible in order to to prevent the, the rush progression of, uh, of the problem. This might actually be more accountable to what you're actually describing. Professor it Goldberg, might very please. well be. And, and it's what's nice about these concepts is that they're all testable. I mean, if you believe people with diabetic retinopathy get worse because of ocular compression, you could, you could establish their baseline then have them sleep with a, uh, a shield and see if their retinopathy uh, in the dependent eye improves where the one that's not doesn't. There's, there's a lot of opportunity to, uh, to, to uh, try to apply the idea to different, different ocular conditions. Michael, thank you very much. It's, it's excellent and, and special talk. If you go back to your, to your slide where you have the table with the side sleepers and the coptic ratio, you, okay. you actually have shown that um, side sleepers prefer to sleep on their right side. That's, they do. That's, that's, that's a well fact known. They, the sleep researchers don't know actually why that is. They, they suppose it's, it's your own heartbeat that you don't feel um, or feel less if you sleep on your right side than on your, on your left side. And, and hence, if, if this was true, we would have, for example, more have more right-sided normal tension glaucoma than left-sided tension glaucoma. Did you ever put this, this theory to the test that this is true? I, I, first of all, congratulations to you for noticing that the right-sided sleeping preference is real and that that's been shown. And though I, I didn't even think about what you just said, that normal tension glaucoma asymmetries uh, may be more prominent on the right side. It's a, it, there's another study uh, that could be done that would support the, the hypothesis and, and would be you know, helpful for treatment. Uh, that's a great observation on your part. If I may add, uh, as a child, we were kind of taught, at least at my country, that we shouldn't apply pressure on our heart side. So on the, high, on the side of our heart when we're sleeping. So most of the people will actually taught to sleep on the right side of that reason. But then well, for people off. like me, who is kindly overweight <laughs> because of gastro <laughs> esophageal reflux is actually better to sleep on the left side. And some people who are actually experiencing that kind of problems will have to the tendency to sleep on the other side. Yes. So there are many aspects that we can actually correlate to all this. Yes, I, I agree. There, the, as I said a little earlier, there are people 
who uh, have no reason to sleep on one side versus the other. And amongst those people, there is a right-sided sleep preference. And then amongst the population, whether it is uh, gastroesophageal reflux or people that have a painful right hip that they don't want to make that the, the dependent side, there's a lot of people that have a, uh, a sleep posture that they, that they take chronically because of a secondary uh, medical problem. And, and you're correct, it, it's all over the place. And unless you ask questions of people about this sort of thing, you, you'll never know. I mean, you don't know what people do in the shower. You don't know what they're doing when they're in the swimming pool. There's a lot of periods of time when people are doing things that, that clinicians have never really thought too much about. And so th this concept is one that I, that I, that I thought would be would be good because we spend a lot of time sleeping. I mean, you're not in the shower too very long, you're not in the pool too very long, but most people spend you know, six to eight hours uh, in a private position that nobody knows about that, that could really have an impact on uh, the, the health of their eyes. Now that's excellent. Are there any further questions? I have to conclude on that, that it's it's amazing that you have to ask the right questions to find the right answers and it's always this, been true this has always distinguishes people with with a very vivid mind that will actually get the, our science even further so i would like to pass to dr goldblum for the conclusion of our session thank you very much dr Goldblum. it has been a pleasure and an honor it was it was my pleasure i assure you and i i hope that i hope to uh to to meet you in person next time all right definitely we look forward All right, thank to you. Bring your guys. guitar with next time. We might. I will. Have a session. Always with the guitar. All right, take care. Enjoy the rest of the program. Thank bye. you. Bye. Bye bye. On va continuer en, en anglais. So I, I think you, you're going to talk to us in, in English, not yes, in French. Of course. Okay. No, in English. So mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's a great pleasure to introduce my, my dear old friend, Francois Majot. He is director of the Clinic Ophthalmique de la Gare, and he's a, a very well-known cornea specialist. But today he's going to talk about, uh, an, I would say, a new field of expertise. You, you introduced me about a year ago, and, and I'm very 